talking about today, Isaiah chapter 6, that famous passage where Isaiah sees a vision of God, high and lifted up and exalted and seated on the throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. And above him were seraphim, each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And that's true whether we recognize it or not. I pray that we will recognize it today. But today we're going we're gonna to talk about worshiping and giving, uh, seeing God as the holy, holy, holy Lord of all the earth. Why don't you stand and worship with us this morning? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the old man knew Jesus when I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness glorious day I needed rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the healing
So, God, we are here um, today to bow down and to worship you, Lord. Um, We lift you on high this morning, God. Lord, I pray for Nathan as he comes up this morning. God, fill him with your Holy Spirit. 
um, give him the words that you want us to hear this morning, that we need to hear this morning. And God, help us to have hearts that can receive this message and ears that can hear it, God. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. If you've got little ones, now's the time for them to head down. Kids Church. Is this good? Can you hear me? All right, today we are in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 5 were basically an introduction to Isaiah's ministry and, um, and kind of the status of the situation in which he ministered. And so his uh, the first five chapters, as you saw, as we walked through them, were describing the spiritual failure of God's people to keep God's covenant, to keep his law, to walk in relationship with him, to obey his commands. And so the, the, the dilemma facing Isaiah was, how could this spiritually compromised and rebellious people living in continual defiance of God's law, how could they ever become what God said they were supposed to become? They were supposed to become this holy nation, this royal priesthood, this light to the, and a blessing to all the nations around them. And the conclusion that we ended up last week in uh, the end of chapter 5 left us with this warning. And here was the warning, and it wasn't just the warning for the people of God in Isaiah's day, it's a warning for us today. If we reject God and His good laws, His righteous laws, and we are unresponsive to the warnings and calls to repentance and obedience, all that is left is darkness. All that is left is judgment. If we reject the light, all that we have left is dark, right? And so the hopeful message, again, over and over again, even though it's a bit of a dark time that we see in Isaiah, and truth, truthfully, as we apply it to our lives today as the people of God in this generation, there's a, we're living in a dark day. But there's also a hopeful message, and we're going to see that he, even here in Isaiah chapter 6, that even as God removes his hand of blessing from the nation and, and disciplines them like any good father would discipline a rebellious child, he never gives up on them. He never quits. He never gets up on them. He loves them. He wants to redeem and restore them. And so we're going to see today in chapter 6 even uh, a, a reminder of the radical grace of the gospel. That's why we've entitled this whole study through the book of Isaiah, the gospel according to Isaiah. God responds to his people with grace and forgiveness and provides um, uh, help even in the midst of our rebellion and hope. And so we're going to begin chapter 6 today in verse 1. Let's go to the first slide. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So Isaiah received his call, and so that all chapters 1 through 5 were introduction, and now this is the kind of the official calling of Isaiah. He received his call as a prophet in the year that King Uzziah died. And why was that significant? Well, all the Israelites and those that knew their history would recognize that King Uzziah was a key king in the history of the people. And his death marked a significant turning point in Israel's relationship with Yahweh, with their God. Second Chronicles 26 tells us a little bit about King Uzziah's reign. That's Second, uh, Second Chronicles 26. It says this, Uz Uzziah was only 16 years old when he first became king in Israel. And he reigned in Jerusalem. Actually, it was Judah. He was over the southern kingdom of Judah. He reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. And he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him, Prophet Zechariah, that should ring a bell to you, who instructed him in the fear of God. And as long as he, this is my, one of my favorite things that it says about Isaiah, I mean, sorry, Uzziah, King Uzziah. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. It's a good promise. That's a general promise. As long as we seek the Lord and walk with the Lord, God will bless and honor us. God gave him success as a king. And God helped him to be victorious in battle over all the nations that were 
uh, at war with him around him. And he built a powerful army and he fortified all the cities of Israel. He grew wealthy in land and livestock. This was the height of the southern kingdom of Judah under the reign of King Uzziah. And his, fr- his fame spread far and wide in the Middle Eastern world because he was greatly helped by the Lord until he became powerful. That's a little warning there. Here we go. Here's the next verse. But after King Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall, as it always does, right? Pride goes before destruction. He was unfaithful. He became unfaithful to the Lord, his God. He, entered, he even entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. You say, oh, that's good. He's, he's worshiping God. Well, not so much. Because Azariah the priest and 80 of his colleagues, other courageous priests, followed the king into the temple and they confronted King Uzziah and they said, it's not right for you, O king, to burn incense to the Lord. That's for the priests and the descendants of Aaron to do who have been consecrated to burn incense. Get out of here. Leave the sanctuary. You've been unfaithful to the Lord and you will not be honored by the Lord God for this. And Uzziah, who had taken a censer uh, of burning incense in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. And while he was raging at the priests in their presence in the temple before the incense altar the Lord in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. And when Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, and so they hurried him out. Indeed, King Uzziah was eager himself to leave because the Lord had afflicted him with leprosy. And King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, As a leper, he was banned from the temple of the Lord, and his son Jotham took charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. Tragic story, right, of King Uzziah. The whole nation, um, this was a kind of symbolic of the whole nation. At one time, they were doing so well. They were prosperous. They were living in right relationship to their God, Yahweh. Things were going well. They had blessing on every side. They had uh, peace, and uh, God was defending them against their enemies. And the, there was plenty of food, and things were going well. But just as Isaiah rebelled against God and no longer was faithful to him, uh, and his pride led to his downfall, that was kind of indicative of the nation as a whole. The whole nation had followed their king into pride and apathy toward God and his law. And so God's patience with them had finally run out. Uzziah's 52-year reign had been kind of the golden era, the high point of the kingdom of Judah. It was a time of peace and prosperity and blessing for the people. Um, and when he died, it was almost, we, we've got that date down to almost the year, approximately 740 BC. When he died, the Assyrian Empire under the leadership of Tiglath-Pileser III, was asserting itself as a regional military power all in the Middle Eastern region. As long as the great king um, and warrior Uzziah had been sitting on the throne in Judah, even when his son Jotham was kind of acting as the front man, but he was still alive and leading the nation, Assyria didn't seem like an immediate threat to Judah because they'd been so dominant in the region for so long. But when King Uzziah died, Uh, The people's hope died with him, and the danger of Assyria could no longer be ignored. Jotham was no Uzziah, and Jotham's son Ahaz was possibly under the influence of a pro-Assyrian party in the government, and so things were starting to crumble. Uzziah's death marked the end of the golden era uh, for the kingdom of Judah. The national pride and glory of Israel died with their king, and so where were the people to turn for hope now? We talked about that last week and the, the, the end of the message of Isaiah chapter 5 and the, this whole situation is to remind us that we cannot put our hope in men. And this was a time of crisis for the, for, the, for the kingdom. And it was at this crucial moment that God supernaturally called Isaiah into the ministry as a prophet to his people. In this dark moment, Isaiah came to see that Yahweh still had a word of hope, a word of of redemption and uh, of new life to speak to his people. And so he, uh, he was excited to begin his ministry in this really challenging season for the nation of Judah. And Isaiah was presumably worshiping in the temple one day when his vision was transported beyond the 
physical surroundings of the temple into the very presence of God, into his heavenly throne room. And Isaiah saw the Lord high and exalted and seated on a throne. Can you imagine? I don't think we can. Uh, so so I, Isaiah does his best job to try to describe what he's seeing here, but words fall short, right? The language that Isaiah uses to describe what he sees emphasizes the majesty and the transcendence and the glorious holiness and power of Almighty God. And, and, and he sees the train of God's kingly robe filling the entire temple. It must have been ma- massive, right? Just the train of the robe filling the temple. Uh, how mag- majestic. If just the train of his robe was filling the temple, what must the king look like on his throne? But actually, um, what's interesting is that Isaiah tells us that he saw the Lord seated on his throne, but all that he describes is the train of his robe. I don't know if that's all that he is, that is made visible to him. But that would be like you saying, we saw the most beautiful bride on her wedding day, and then just describing the train of her wedding gown and nothing else. But he's doing it in breathless tones and with such magnificence and wonder and awe at the glory and the majesty that just the end of his robe looked like. Can you imagine? Why doesn't he describe God himself? Well, it could be that God is so holy and so pure and so glorious that even when Moses, with whom Yahweh, actually the Bible says, spoke face to face as with a friend, when when Moses asked to see him in all of his glory, that God said, When my glory passes by you, Moses, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then I will remove my hand and you can see my back, but you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. And so while God does give Isaiah here a vision of his glory and manifest his glory to Isaiah, he still veils it because created beings are unable to bear the raw power and majesty and glory of Almighty God. So Isaiah sees only the long train of God's robe as he's seated on his glorious throne, and it's about all he can handle. What else does Isaiah see in this throne room? Let's go to verse number two. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, 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 is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. So the king's angelic attendants are glorious cherubim, sorry, seraphim, which means something like, by the way, the the word seraphim means something like burning ones, flaming ones. These weren't cute little chubby babies with wings. They weren't mere images or fanciful ideas or symbols. These were real spiritual, living spiritual beings, living flames of pure worship hovering around the throne of God like a choir singing back and forth to one another in continuous unbroken praise, delighting in their creator God for his infinite holiness and all surpassing glory. And all this is, although this is the only place in the Bible where seraphim are actually mentioned by name, we do see in the prophet Ezekiel's vision in chapter one of Ezekiel that he too saw some similar angelic beings around God's throne. Listen to what Ezekiel, how Ezekiel describes him. He says, these angelic beings whose appearance was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Okay, there we get the idea of burning ones again. Each had two wings covering his body. And when the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. You ever been uh, to a, 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 a mighty waterfall? Like I remember being um, going out in the uh, on the little boat that they take you out uh, at the um, Niagara Falls, and you go up to the falls, and and you can't you can hardly speak to each other over the roar, the actual deafening roar of the water pouring down over Niagara Falls. Like, and that's what he's kind of trying to describe here. When they flew and their wings uh, beat, uh, it was like the roar of a mighty waterfall and the voice. Of, uh, of the Almighty and a tumult of an army. And there came a voice above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. And above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne. Here we are again in the throne room of Lapis Lazuli. And uh, it's like um, 
uh, a gemstone. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of, of a man. And I saw from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. And like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. And there was, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when he saw it, he said, when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. So you get the idea that that's Ezekiel's vision. We got the idea of Isaiah's vision of these angelic beings around the throne and they are awesome. And as awesome as these beings are, they don't hold the candle to the glory of the one seated on the throne. And what are they proclaiming? What are they saying? They're saying, holy, holy, holy. This is the only time here and again in the throne room in Revelation chapter 4 where we see the angels around the throne, these, probably these same beings, uh, seraphim, around the throne proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. This is the only place in all of Scripture, these two places where this threefold repetition is found. And, and it's not just like the repetition in our modern day worship songs where we repeat things over and over again. No, this is, this is for great uh, intensified compounded emphasis. It isn't holy plus holy plus holy. It's perfection times perfection times perfection. Compounding holiness, all surpassing holiness. Holiness is that supreme truth about God. It is his moral separateness. He's distinctly different from everything else and everyone else. All that is hun unholy, um, he's distinctively different from all that is unholy or sinful. Um, and that is what makes him um, unapproachable in the sense that the holy cannot be in the presence of the unholy because God is not like us. He is different in every category. He's he, in, in every way, and he's in a completely different category altogether. In fact, he's even very dis distinctly different from the angels that surround him, the seraphim and the cherubim and the, the vast uh, host of heavenly angel beings that attend to him and worship him um, because they are created and he is uncreated. And they are created for his glory. So the entire book of Isaiah echoes with the impact of this vision. He's, Isaiah is going to refer back to it and, and all that he says is done in light of this moment, this vision, this calling. Isaiah's favorite name for God, for instance, throughout the book is the Holy One of Israel. He will always call Yahweh the Holy One of Israel because of this vision. It never, it never left his mind. He uses it over 30 times in the book of Isaiah. And this thrice holy, 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 holy God fills heaven and earth with his glory. Everything that God created was his for in order to display his glory. Here's a good question for you. We ask this to our kids, and, and we should be asking this question. Why did God create anything at all? I mean, he didn't need to. I mean, God was complete and completely satisfied in himself. He was lacking nothing. There wasn't like this thing like says, I'm incomplete, so I need to create the heavens and the earth and create mankind so to fill some void in my life. He wasn't bored. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't, he, he lived within perfect community and perfect love and perfect fellowship in the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's always been perfectly happy and fully at peace. So why create anything? Especially creatures with a free will whom he knew would rebel against him and grieve his spirit. Well, as we said already, he didn't do it to remedy any lack of or deficiency in himself. He did it for his own glory. He did it to glorify himself, to, to spread the goodness of his glory to others so others may enjoy, enjoy his glory and his goodness as well. The delight that God feels in being God is so great that his exuberance spills out into creation, a whole creation filled with his glory, and he wants all of creation to delight in his goodness as well. That's why when he had made everything, he looked around and said, Behold, it is very good. It is good. God saw that all that he made was good, and he delighted in it, and his creation delighted in their God. And even though God's glorious, very good creation had been laid very quickly corrupted by the curse of sin and the rebellion of mankind, it's still his desire and plan to make earth a glorious extension of heaven. This is the ultimate goal. This is where it's going. For his kingdom to come and his will to be done here 
and in us, just as it is done in heaven. That is the ultimate goal still. That was the purpose for which he created it, and that's the purpose to which he's going to recreate it. Each of you, myself, all of us here today, were created to reflect God's glory. And the beautiful thing that as his image bearers, who were created male and female in his image, we reflect the glory of God in unique ways that nothing else in all of creation can. What an incredible privilege. And so that gives meaning and purpose to your existence. You ever ask that question? Why am I here? I mean, what am I doing anyway? What is my purpose? What meaning does my life have? The good news is that if you will let God redeem you and make you new, remake you and restore you to your original intended glory, you will get to reflect the glory of God in the way that he intended from the beginning. But God's glory gets obscured, right? By our pursuit of our own glory at the expense of his. And we trivialize God. This is the issue of of Isaiah's day, and this is the issue of our day, continues to be the issue of mankind. We trivialize God, we make him small, and we deify ourselves. We make ourselves like God. We deify ourselves. We become so absorbed in our own petty ambitions. We, we're stars in the, uh, the movie of our own making, right? But the truth is God not only deserves to reign supreme in the world and in us, He actually does reign supreme. He is actually reigning supreme right now, whether we acknowledge it or not. And his reign is glorious and it's good. And so what was the result of the worship of the seraphim that were around the throne? Isaiah tells us in verses four and five. Let's go to the next slide. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me! I cried, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of an unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Put yourself in Isaiah's shoes here. I've tried. It's hard. It's hard to kind of wrap my mind around it. But I get the impression that he's fearfully standing as far away as possible from the sovereign Lord who's seated on the throne. He's standing in the doorway, kind of, right? And he's listening to the burning ones declare, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. They're worshiping the infinite Holy One and their worship thunders through the temple and the whole place is shaking and reverberating with it. Can you imagine? The doorpost and the threshold where where Isaiah is standing is shaking and he feels it shaking in his bones and he's probably shaking. He's standing in the threshold of the doorway and he's trembling in awe of the one that's seated on the throne and, and who is filling the temple with smoke from the altar and from his glory. I I can't even, it's hard. I've tried to envision this. I was trying to think about this and put myself there all week long as I was thinking about this, and it's hard to even imagine. I mean, I can get a scene in my mind, but I can't imagine the emotion and the awesomeness of that moment. uh, And so here Isaiah was seeing and hearing and feeling and all the emotions, and it must have been absolutely terrifying to be in the presence of the Holy One and seeing God in all of his majesty and holiness on the throne. Isaiah realized that that classic little uh, Sesame Street, uh, you know, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong. And and I think it's me. I I should not be here, right? Is Sesame Street before your time? Probably. Sorry about that. Um, He's like, I should not be here. I, I don't belong here. I'm unclean and everything around me is incredibly holy. What am I going to do? Woe to me. Remember, he'd just been declaring woe to the nation. That's judgment. That's like, that's like lament. We're in serious trouble here. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, God is the blessed and sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. And this is what Paul says about him. He alone is immortal and he lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see, and to him be honor and eternal power. In John 3, 19 through 20, uh, John said that light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Uh, Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light. Why? For fear that their deeds will be exposed. 
And so here we got Isaiah standing in the light of God's holiness, and he's in sheer terror because he knows that he's seen in all of his dirtiness and his filthiness, his sin, his evil, his, his immorality, his idolatry, his evil motives and evil heart. They've been exposed in the light of God's holiness, and it's shocking and it's painful. All the greed, all the laziness, all the selfishness and sinful anger and lust and gossip and slander and gluttony and drunkenness. In light of God's holiness, Isaiah sees himself as God sees him. Reminded me of the the tax collector that Jesus told about that went to the temple one day to pray. It was the last ditch effort, right? Feels like he's hated by God and man, like he doesn't have a friend in the world. And he stands afar off the outer courtyard of the temple in Jerusalem, there was a called the courtyard of the Gentiles. It was where the, even the unclean could go if they wanted to approach God. It wasn't for God's people. God's people had a seat up towards the front. But the riffraff, the unclean, the unwashed, the unholy, the ungodly, the pagan, the far from God, they could come, but they had to stand at the back in the court of the Gentiles. And that's where the very back where this tax collector, which was the most hated and despised person in Judeo culture of, of, of that day. And he's standing back there and he can't even look toward the temple. He can't even look toward heaven. He sees himself in all of his, he's so aware of his sinfulness that all he can do is just beat on his chest and cry out, woe to me, woe to me, I'm ruined. God, be merciful to me. I'm sinful. I'm unclean. I shouldn't be here. And he sees his standing before this holy, holy, holy God as being so utterly hopeless. hopeless. He doesn't even ask for anything. He doesn't ask for cleansing. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't ask for deliverance. He just says, have mercy. Because he realizes, just like Isaiah realizes in this moment, that whatever God determines to do with him will be justly deserved. And because the holiness of God is, is to the sinner a consuming fire. Everything in the throne room is full of fire and smoke, and he's going to be consumed. He just knows it. So he says, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm done. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship, I'm good. God and I, we're pretty good. But we walk in darkness. We're liars. We don't live out the truth. There's no posturing. There's no pretending in the presence of the all-knowing, holy, holy, holy God. But here's the good news. Isaiah underestimates the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. God hadn't brought him to this moment, hadn't given him this vision, a glimpse of his glory in order to annihilate him, but to cleanse him and to call him and to set him apart for his service. Do you know what we, as God's people, as the church, what we so desperately need today? We need this kind of a renewed vision of the sovereign, holy, holy King of kings and Lord of lords seated on his throne, And to see God for who he truly is and what he says is true about himself. So that we can take an honest look at ourselves in the brilliant light of his holiness. And it's ugly. And it's shameful. And it's painful. And instead of giving ourselves a pass and go, well, you know, I hear a lot of Christians say this all the time. You know, nobody's perfect. But really, I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. I'm better than most. I'm sitting here in church, aren't I? I get points for that, right? But in, instead, we need to quit trying to justify our sinfulness and quit seeing ourselves through other people's eyes, the better than most, good enough. We need to see ourselves standing in a room that is reverberating with the awesome, fearful holiness of God's presence and radiating with His brilliant glory and in sincere humility to ask ourselves, What right do I have to even be here? That's where Isaiah was. Let's look to verse number six. Next slide. God's grace cleanses our sin. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Can you imagine this, seeing this burning one flying to you with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar? And with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Boom. That's grace. That is grace. That is mercy. He didn't give him what he deserved. In fact, he gave him what he did not deserve. Favor, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. That's grace. Do you know what biblical Christianity offers that no other religion or worldview can offer? A God who provides a definitive once and for all atonement for sin. Ask yourself, if you're kicking around the tires of other religions, or if you're a student of other religions, ask that question of the gurus or of the books or of the, the adherence to that religion. Ask, ask that all important, the most important question. How does one atone for sin? What do we do with our sin? Some will say there is no sin. Some will say, well, here's the list of achieving nirvana or of, of achieving enlightenment. Here's the things that you need to do. Um, here's the list of righteous deeds that you need to do to um, overcome or compensate the good that you do, I mean, the bad that you do with good. But no other human religion has a God who provides and actually provides himself as the atoning sacrifice for sin. 1 John 4.10 said, This is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a gift. What a gift of grace. What an undeserved, unmerited favor from a loving God. That is love. Truly love. Not giving us what we do deserve and instead giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy, grace, forgiveness. And so the altar uh, of burnt offering in the Old Testament, if you've read the Old Testament at all, you're familiar with the altar of burnt offering. There was also an altar of incense in the actual tabernacle and temple. Some think it's referred to that altar of incense. Some think it's the altar, uh, the burnt offering, uh, uh, the burnt offering of the altar that was outside the temple where the priests would actually sacrifice the lambs and the bulls and the goats for sin offerings. But the altar of burnt offering in the Old Testament was the place where the holiness and justice and righteous wrath of God against sin met with his love and grace and mercy. Most of the blood of the sacrificial lamb was sprinkled on the sides of the altar before the entire lamb was placed on the altar and burnt as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. But a small portion of that blood was taken by the high priest behind the veil into the most holy place and sprinkled on what was called the mercy seat between the cherubim on the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, the two cherubim whose wings touched and right in the middle of the top cover of the Ark was called the mercy seat. And the high priest would sprinkle the blood there as a picture of the blood atonement, the sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. What an incredible picture of both the wrath just wrath of God against sin and also the mercy of God meeting in the offering of the sacrificial lamb. And here in this vision of Isaiah in the throne room of God, one of the burning ones flew to the altar and took a burning coal with tongs. He used tongs not because it was burning. He was on fire too. He wasn't going to get burnt by the fire, but he picked it up off of the altar with tongs because it was holy. It was a holy thing. And he touches Isaiah's sinful, dirty mouth with it. And it doesn't harm him like he thought. I'm undone. This is going to consume me with fire because of my sin. Instead, it doesn't harm him, but it, it cleanses him. It heals him. It redeems and restores and reconciles him. And what you and I need to see in the context of, this, of the whole Bible is that this burning coal represents the completed atoning work of Christ on the cross for you and for me. This atonement, this cleansing was not available just for Isaiah. It's available for you and I. And this demonstrates how God responds to broken, ruined sinners who acknowledge their sin and their need for cleansing. This is the hope of redemption. This is the good news of the gospel. So back to John chapter, 1 John chapter 1. 
If we walk in the light as he is in the light, God, the light of his holiness and glory, if we walk in that light, if we take that risk of coming into the light and having our sin exposed and cleansed and redeemed, then we can have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Let's be honest. Let's say what God says about our sin. Let's see what God says. Uh, let's see what God sees about our sin. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify or to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the hope. That's the gospel. And he's provided it through his own son, Jesus. What is confession? It's not going into a little room with me. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Confession is agreeing with God about my sin and you agreeing with God, to, with God about your sin. And it is the prerequisite to cleansing and forgiveness and restoration. But when we confess our sins to him and acknowledge that we are broken, ruined sinners and we need God's grace, that cleansing from sin is instantaneous and total. We don't do anything to earn it. We didn't do anything to gain it. It's not because he sees some merit in us that he, he uh, uh, says you've, you've kind of earned your way partway there and we're going to meet in the middle. No, God does it all. He does it all. There's nothing we can do. We're helpless and hopelessly lost. He says we're dead. That means separated from God because of our sins. We're completely at his mercy, and yet he offers it. He invites it. And the immediate effect, effect of atonement in Isaiah's case and in our case is reconciliation. Let's look at verse, verse 8. Now that he's cried out in humility and repentance at his sinful state and God graciously, mercifully cleanses him. Then look at what he says in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah, Isaiah feels like he can speak to God now because he's been cleansed of his sin. Isaiah has had his sin atoned for, his guilt removed, and he's now free to actually be in the presence of God without dying. And to speak to him and to participate in his eternal purposes in the world. For the first time in this vision, God himself speaks. And listen to the surprising words of the holy, 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 sovereign Lord of the universe. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Send where? Go where? Do what? Say what? Does this sound like a God who doesn't want his people to be redeemed and doesn't want his people to be reconciled to him? Does this sound like he's predestined them to destruction and has turned a, a, a deaf ear to their cries for help? Listen to what he says. He, uh, who will go? Whom shall I send? He has a message for the human race and, and for his chosen people in particular. But he needs a messenger. He needs a spokesman. He needs an ambassador, a representative on earth. But he's not looking for just anyone. He wants someone who knows what it means to be forgiven. Hmm, who could that be? In this setting, who could he possibly call to be his emissary, his ambassador, his representative to other sinful, broken people, uh, somebody who's been forgiven and redeemed? Isaiah, that's it, that's it, right? I don't want to read too much into this, but it's interesting to note that this is the only time in the scriptures where a prophet is called without a direct calling. In every other instance, God meets with them, usually comes to earth, to call them or calls them up to a vision like Ezekiel or, or Jeremiah or Isaiah, but calls them by name. And so why is it that God is seeking a volunteer here rather than a conscript? He's not drafting Isaiah. He's calling him. He's inviting him, him to, asking him to volunteer, if you will. At the same time, God has given Isaiah this vision. He has called him up into the throne room here. As far as we know, he's the whole only human being present in this whole scene. So God's saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And everybody's looking around, and, and I, I think uh, Isaiah feels all eyes on him, maybe. It's probable that God's call and Isaiah's response was the plan all along, right? It's not like there were a lot of different choices there at this moment. But I do think it's instructive that those who have an encounter with God and are recipients of his grace 
are and should be willing participants, eager volunteers in the service of their holy, gracious, sovereign God who has just cleansed them and redeemed them, right? It should be, the, it should be our, uh, as Paul says in Romans 12, too, it's our reasonable service. It's our, it's our reasonable act of spiritual worship. It's the only response to those who have been redeemed by God. And I believe we're living in a day in a culture much like Isaiah's. People, all the people of this world, even people who claim to believe in God and even go to church are actually often living their daily lives as if, as if God doesn't exist. And so for those who have had their hearts truly uh, convicted and drawn and their minds and their lives and their entire selves transformed by the, and cleansed by the glorious grace and mercy of God, for all, of, all that have truly been converted like that, the mission and the calling is the same. God is still asking this question right now, today. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? The need is great. Who will be our, our ambassador? When he's saying our, he's probably talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He may be talking about the entire uh, population of heaven, all the angelic hosts. But who will be our ambassadors? Who will represent our kingdom on earth? To those who will desperately need to hear the message of the gospel. And he's still looking for volunteers today. And, and, and maybe even more urgently than in Isaiah's day because the time is even shorter today. I think the sequence of Isaiah's call is important. The process of becoming a, a servant of God begins first with recognizing that we're not qualified. Um, Isaiah was not there giving his credentials. He was there crying out, woe is me. I'm done. I'm ruined. I'm destroyed. I shouldn't be here. In fact, our situation is worse than, than, than a lack of qualifications or credentials. Our situation is hopeless. We deserve death in light of the holiness of God. We're ruined sinners who have rebelled against him and we're running headlong to hell. That's where it starts. We've got to recognize that. The next step is to recognize the nature and character of God, to see God for who he truly is in all of his holiness and glory. And how we respond to seeing God's holiness is everything. Our response is everything. And there's really only two options here. To run from God and the light of his holiness further into the darkness of our rebellion and fear and shame and guilt and sin. And, and, and for fear that our sin will be exposed. So a fearful running from the light of God into the darkness. Uh, we don't want to give up our sin. We want to continue down the path that we're going. Or here's the other response. We will, in fear and trembling, step into the light of God's holiness and have all of our stuff exposed. And with humility and repentance, beg for cleansing. Cry out for cleansing and healing and redemption and restoration to receive God's gracious cleansing and salvation. And only then, only at that moment, we've, when we've responded by coming into the light and receiving God's cleansing. Only then are we ready to get a glimpse of God's heart for others and for lost people and, and then to offer ourselves in, him, sir, in his service to help um, invite and call those lost people to repentance and faith in him. But please hear this. God's gracious call and willingness to use us is not for us to make a name for ourselves. It's not so that we can uh, parade it around on social media or to build our brand or to fill, fulfill our own dreams or to have other people, to get the approval and praise of men and to have people think, wow, they're a really good Christian or they're a really good person. No, it's total surrender to God's call and to God's service no matter where it takes us. It's not a life of basking in the glory of the praise of men. Accepting God's call, in fact, will not make you popular. Ask Isaiah or Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, or any other prophet of God, ask Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be actually hated by everyone because of me. He said it this way, if you do what I do, if you live how I live, if you say what I say, you're going to be treated how I was treated. If they call me 
uh, say that I do what I do by the power of Satan, what do you think they're going to do to you? And they killed me. What do you think they're going to do to you? And then he says, so do not be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. There's nothing hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, I want you to speak in the daylight. What I whisper in your ear, I want you to proclaim from the rooftops. Don't be afraid of those who kill your body but cannot kill your soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul or self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory of the Father and all of the holy angels. Does that sound like a mission you're willing to accept? That's the mission of Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's not just getting our uh, get-out-of-jail-free card and our little ticket to heaven. It's actually a mission to be representatives of Jesus on the earth, to engage in his mission, in his purpose, which is to seek and to save lost people, to speak the truth of God, even when it's not popular, maybe especially when it's not popular. Nothing else in this life and nothing else in this world matters. Nothing, nothing. So Isaiah's calling is not to successful ministry as the world defines success. He was called to faithfulness in communicating God's message. That's it. And because he accepted the difficult mission, we're still reading the book of Isaiah uh, nearly 30 centuries later. Now, most of the sermons you'll hear preached on Isaiah chapter 6 end at this, at this point. But if you're looking at your Bible right now, you see there's a few, mess, few verses left in Isaiah. Because the chapter doesn't end there, and neither does the message here. In order to be faithful to the full intent of the message, we've got to talk about the rest of the passage briefly. And you're going to see why here in the following verses. Let's look at the message that Isaiah was commissioned by God to speak to the people in verse 9. Here's what God says. Go. Go and tell the people. And here's what you're to tell them. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. What? Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Huh? Make, make the heart of this people calloused. That's hard. Make their ears dull. Blind their eyes. Otherwise... They might see with their eyes, they might hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What? Isn't that what you want? That's the message, Lord? Where's the compassion, the, the grace, the forgiveness that you just extended to me? What kind of mission and message has Isaiah been given here? Interestingly enough, this passage may be the most quoted passage in all of the New Testament, this section of Isaiah. God's long-suffering patience with his people had finally run out. He's fed up with Isaiah's generation. And so he sends Isaiah to preach a message that, given their already hardened hearts, is only going to push them farther away from God. He sends Isaiah to tell them, here's the deal. I, God sent me to tell you, give you a message, and here it is. You're not going to listen. You're not going to understand. You're not going to believe it. What a strange mission. God's going to use Isaiah's preaching to actually further harden their already hard hearts. You know what this is called? This is called judicial hardening. L listen to God's commissioning of the prophet Jeremiah, who came uh, about 150 years after Isaiah, right at the time where all of, a lot of Isaiah's prophecies were coming true. In fact, Jeremiah was there to see the siege of Jerusalem, and he was carried off in exile. Uh, he was given the option, and he ended up staying. But um, he, he saw firsthand what happened when King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. He saw the city burn, the walls torn down, the, the temple destroyed everything. And here's, here's uh, the message to the prophet Jeremiah. God says this, it's similar recognize this. He says, I'm going to pronounce my judgment on my people because their wickedness in forsaking me and in burning incense and worshiping other gods that their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Don't be terrified by them, Jeremiah, or I will terrify you before them. Today, 
I've made you, Jeremiah, a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and all the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And he really was one of the few that survived the famine of Jerusalem and the, the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction. They put everybody to the sword. They spared his life. King Nebuchadnezzar did. Listen to Ezekiel's calling. Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, just as their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I'm sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Here's the problem. There's a hard-heartedness there. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they will listen or not, or fail to listen, for they are rebellious people. They will know that a prophet is being among them. Your words will stand as a judgment against them. And you, son of man, don't be afraid of them or their words. Don't be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Don't be afraid of what they say. Don't be terrified for them. They are rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they will listen or fail to listen. For they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. And don't rebel like them. So, so God's calling for his prophets in this crucial time was very similar. That's Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And what he's saying is, after so much patient preaching and encouraging and challenging by his prophets and drawing and calling and convicting them, and they still continue to harden their hearts and to turn away in hard-hearted unbelief, at some point, like Paul says in Romans, when, they, when people have rejected God and his truth and, and his prophets and his word, and they don't even like to think about God, they don't even want to hear his name. I mean, they told Jeremiah, shut your mouth or we'll shut it for you. No longer speak to us in that name. What name? Yahweh, their God, their covenant God. What had happened? They didn't even like to hear the name of Yahweh. They threw him in an empty cistern and hoped that he drowned in there. They left him to die. Uh, tradition has it that Isaiah was sawn in two, alive. They didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hear. And, and Romans tells us that when a people gets to that place where they've rejected God and his truth, they don't even want to think about him. They don't want to hear his name. They want to live and act as if he doesn't exist. They want to do what they want to do. They don't want anybody telling them how to live. God goes, okay, have it your way. And he gives them over. That's the language of Romans 1. He gives them over to their unbelief, and he hardens them even further. It's a judicial hardening saying, this is what you want. Okay, be careful what you wish for. This is what you're going to get. This is what you're going to have. So they've hardened their hearts, and then he comes along and hardens them again. So what's the lesson here? This is important. I want you to hear this today. This is really, really important. Every time you hear the word of God preached, you come away from that exposure to God's truth, either a little closer to God or a little farther away from him. It's important. You're either a little more softened in your heart towards God or you're a little more hardened in your heart towards him. You never stay just the same, right? God's word doesn't allow you to claim neutrality. You, you, you don't just get to hold the gospel at arm's length in critical judgment and detachment, saying like, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a non-position on God and his, his word and his gospel. It's not how it works. Instead, instead James 1, tells us to get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that has been so prevalent in our lives and to humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Humbly receive God's word, which will save you. It will redeem you. It will cleanse you. It will make you new. The Apostle Paul thought of his ministry. He, he used some interesting words to describe his ministry. He said, I'm spreading the aroma of Christ. We have a, like a, a, a essential oil diffuser in our house that Amy diffuses essential oils in. And we're all healed in our house. Uh, but the, the aroma starts wafting through our house. This is how Paul thought about his ministry, right? Spreading the aroma of Christ. To some, it was the fragrance of life. As they heard it and responded to it, it brought life. To others, it was the stench of death. It was foolishness to them. They stopped their ears. They say, stop it. I don't want to hear it. What's the difference? Paul said some 
willingly received it with grace and humility, and it saved their souls. Others ran screaming from the building with their hands over their ears and started a riot. Same man speaking the same message with two dramatically different responses. What's the difference? It wasn't about the Apostle Paul and his delivery. Jesus' ministry produced the same results. It wasn't about Jesus and his delivery. It had everything to do with the listeners. Some of them had made themselves sermon-proof with hard hearts. And, and here's the scary thing. Here's the dangerous thing. If we resist God long enough and we're hard-hearted enough, he will say, okay. And he'll remove the light from our understanding, actually blinding our eyes and stopping our ears and hardening our hearts to the point that faith becomes impossible. What a tragic moment that is. What a dark and horrific moment that is. Remember after Jesus told the parable of the soils, his disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? Don't you know that they don't understand you? And he answered this, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. Why? Because they had hardened their hearts. They'd already made up their minds about Jesus and nothing was going to sway them. Not miraculous signs, not the healing of the lame, the curing of the leper, the feeding of the 5,000, the stealing of the storm, nothing. And so Jesus said, for whoever has light, more will be given to them. When you respond to the light, you step into the light, more will be given. And to who, uh, whoever does not have, who rejects light, uh, um, what, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And that is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not perceive. And hearing, they do not listen or understand. And then listen to what he said. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them. That's what Jesus said about the people of his day. What, G what Isaiah said about the people of Isaiah's day is true of the people in Jesus' day. And dare I say it's true of the people in our day. Jesus and Isaiah and Paul all faced the preacher's dilemma. What happens if, if hearers are resistant to the truth? What should you do? What if they won't listen? The only recourse is to tell the truth yet again, even more clearly than before. But here's the danger in doing this. Every time you do this, you're exposing them to the, the risk of rejecting the truth yet again and therefore increasing the hardness of their hearts. And it could even be that the next time, that next rejection will prove to be the point at which the heart is hardened beyond recovery. God forbid. There comes a time when God shuts the door of repentance like he shut the door of the ark in, in Noah's day. And like he grabbed and jerked um, Lot and his family out of Sodom in Lot's day. And like he's calling out a remnant in Isaiah's day and in our day too. Here's the good news for today. Praise be to God. That time is not yet today. And so I'm going to challenge you as we close with the warning of Hebrews chapter 3. Watch out, brothers and sisters. This is Hebrews chapter 3. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be any of you with an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily. While, while it is still called today, there's this urgency. While it is still day, while you still have time, while there is still time, so that none of you will be hardened by sin's deception. Here's the last couple verses, and here's the glimmer of hope. We'll go to the last slide. Then I said, Isaiah said, how long, O oh Lord? How, how, how long am I going to have to preach this horrific message? And he answered, this is hard. Until the cities lie ruined without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted, the fields are ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. <laughs> and this is staggering. Though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But... As the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be a stump in the land. Isaiah was stunned and heartbroken by his mission. This is what you want me to say? How, how long am I going to have to say this? Seeing you will not see. Hearing you will not hear. Listening you will not. Your hearts will be hard. Like, like Jesus who wept over Jerusalem in, in Luke 19. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He's weeping. Isaiah is in anguish over the unbelief of his people. And he finds no pleasure in the thought that his message is actually going to be used against them to condemn them. 
and he's secretly hoping that God's going to relent and he's going to change his mind and he wonders out loud to what extent this, is, this, this hardening is going to affect the people around him. How far will God go? How long, O oh Lord? Three weeks? S six months? Five years? W where is this going? How, how will this end, Lord? What about your promises to your people Israel? And so here at the very beginning of Isaiah's nearly 60-year ministry, he already knows how the story ends in total devastation. It doesn't happen in his lifetime. It's like 175 years after he dies that Jerusalem is destroyed. But this is staggering. The losses will be like 90%. 90% of the people will die by sword or famine or plague. Nebuchadnezzar leads siege to Jerusalem for a year and a half, and it's devastating. And the people that Isaiah preaches to will be like a forest that is clear-cut so that only stumps remain. Everything else is gone. And even those stumps then will be set fire and burned over. Utter devastation. God is describing the eventual and total collapse of the nation. And it's all for one reason and one reason alone. They refused to listen to God. How tragic, how heartbreaking. But even in this last moment, even in this dark moment, God's grace appears. Look at the glimmer of hope in this last line here in chapter 6, the last line in verse 13. What will all the felling and burning accomplish? It clears the ground for new growth. The only hope of restoration and new life is, the near, is found in near total destruction of what exists. It's only when all hope in man is lost that a glimmer, true glimmer of hope appears. See, if the people were allowed to continue as they were, there really is going to be no hope. There is only one path that they're on, and it leads to destruction. The, the godless society must be torn down in order for everything to be recreated and made new, and God's new kingdom established, and that's where it's going at the end of our age, too. So God is going to bring judgment, but not completely. He's going to preserve a remnant. Look at what it says. So the holy seed will be the stump in the land. A holy seed, that has, that have, has a note of promise. A seed uh, bears life in itself and produces new life, fruit. He's going to preserve a remnant of those who are responsive to him, those who did not rebel against him, and he's going to raise them up and set them apart as holy, he's going to use them for his great and redemptive purposes. I'm getting ahead of myself, but Isaiah 11 tells us that there's going to be a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. A branch from his roots will bear fruit. And from the earth, so, so for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wow, that's where it's going. Doesn't feel like that right now, though, does it? Doesn't look like that from Isaiah's standpoint. But God was finished with Isaiah's generation, but, but this wasn't the end of Israel's story. They didn't defeat, they couldn't defeat God's eternal plan of redemption for his people. Jesus is going to be the shoot that's going to grow up out of the stump of Jesse. He's going to be the redeemer. And he, he did come 2,000 years, well, um, 700 years later. And by his grace and redemption, he promised to make all things new, and he's going to make good on that promise. Now, if that doesn't make your heart leap for joy, that there is hope, it looks dark around us, but there's hope, then you need a softer heart. You need some more grace. You need some more light. Nothing else can, can save us from our deadness. We need a, a new vision, a renewed vision of God's blazing holiness. See, God wants us to see the truth of who he is so that we can see ourselves as we truly are. We're not basically good people with the occasional tendency to mess up. We're proud and arrogant and self-centered and sinful and cruel and corrupted by sin. But God is gracious, and there's still time to humbly repent and to turn from our sin to him and be cleansed and forgiven and restored to right relationship with God. And then I would say to those of us who are Christians today, those of us who do believe, where are the Christians today who will answer God's call? Who whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Who will go for me? Who will leave, as Jesus said, houses and lands and families and father and brothers and sisters and mothers and children 
to take up the cross of Christ in service to him. Who will take up the mantle and say yes to God's call to be his agents of redemption in the land, to be his ambassadors. As the great missionary C.T. Studd said, to become nobodies in order to tell the broken and the outcast of the, of the holy God who has died for them because he loves them. Who will do this? Who will answer that call? I believe that God is still calling people today, calling out his servants today to say, yes, here am I, send me. I'll go, whether people will listen or not. I'll be faithful to sow the seed, to, to give the message, and I'll trust that God will preserve and redeem a harvest of souls, a remnant that's going to grow into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a light to the nations. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that we've got the hope of the gospel. Even as it's dark around us, even as it seems that our generation has abandoned you, there is hope and there is light, not in, not in man, not in a political leader, not in new policies, but in Messiah, Redeemer, Jesus, the Savior, the King of kings and Lord of lords who has promised to make us new and then to use us as agents of change, of uh, preserving agents in this world to make other people new too. And then one day you're going to come, you're going to return and to make all things new. And we look forward to that day. Help us to be faithful. Help us to answer your call, to be your ambassadors in this world, to declare your ministry of reconciliation to the whole world. Be reconciled to God. Help us to be faithful in this generation for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand in close service with um, singing out how holy is our God and how worthy is the Lamb.
you'll get a fresh vision, a fresh glimpse of the glory of God, the holiness of God, and ourselves in light of that. Listen, if you want to talk about where you stand with God and you want somebody to pray with you and help, help you maybe take the next step and what God's leading you to do and maybe a step of repentance and faith or maybe a step of obedience to answer his call, love to talk with you about that, love to pray with you about that. We want to get past just playing church and punching our religion card here. We want to actually act as God has act us and called, us, called us to live as his people. So uh, however that might be for you and whatever God step to get God is leading you to take, take it. And if you need somebody to walk with you through that and pray with you through that, I'm happy to do that. We've got others that are willing to do that too. Have a great week. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. God bless you.